Hi, everyone. All right, we're going to get started. It's so, it's, <laughs> it's great to be in person in a way where you have to like wait for the room to quiet. It's such a foreign experience. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Julie Rose, an associate professor in the Department of Government. And I'm really so pleased to be with all of you for the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and the Social Sciences first in-person event since March of 2020. So it's been a long time, and it's really great pleasure to be assembled all together again for this occasion in particular. And welcome to also to those of you who are joining on the live stream. I think we've got another good crowd there. It's really great for us to continue using this remote learning trick that we've learned over the past year and a half. So today's event is co-sponsored by the Rockefeller Center, which um, is a vital institution at Dartmouth featuring interdisciplinary engagement with policy topics, and also uh, by the Dartmouth Political Union, which is a nonpartisan student organization that was founded in 2018 to provide space um, for respectful political discourse on campus. And the talk today is also part of the legal studies faculty groups event series for the year, which is convened for this year by myself and Professor Herschel Nachlis. So we're gathered here today to observe Constitution Day, which marks the signing of the United States Constitution on September 17th. And this is an occasion for which all federally funded uh, educational institutions are required to provide an educational program. Uh, today's event then is you know, fulfilling this obligation, but this is one of those very happy circumstances where the obligation is entirely superfluous because we are really, much more importantly, honored and delighted to be welcoming uh, Dartmouth's own Professor Sonu Beatty to give us a talk today. So Professor Beatty depart, uh, is the professor of government, and the, he has a lot of titles, so is also the Joel Parker 1811 Professor in Law and Political Science, and the Hans Class of 80 and Kate Morris Director of the Ethics Institute. Professor Beatty's areas of research span constitutional law and contemporary political theory, and as the Dartmouth article on his appointment uh, as the Director of the Ethics Institute noted, in a sentence that I would have said as an undergraduate with a great deal of awe, he has six degrees, including a JD from Harvard Law School and a PhD from Yale University. Professor Beatty is the author of four books, including Rejecting Rights, Beyond Race, Sex, and Sexual Orientation, Legal Equality Without Identity, and uh, most recently also Private Racism, an excellent book I'd, all, I'd recommend to all of you, um, as well as many prominent legal and political philosophy articles and many law review articles. He has very impressively twice won the Jerome Goldstein Award for Distinguished Teaching, chosen by the classes of 2014 and the class of 2017. And he teaches popular courses on civil liberties, constitutional law, development and theory, and a seminar on contemporary readings on justice. Today we have the treat of all being Professor Beatty's students uh, for his talk, which is especially timely and I suspect is also going to be encouraging, entitled The Science of the Constitution, the Supreme Court, and a Practice of Disagreement. It's a real pleasure to have Professor Beatty as a colleague and as a friend, and it's a real pleasure to welcome him up today. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, thanks, uh, Julie. Uh, let me say, uh, Professor Rose is a colleague in political theory, uh, and it's really wonderful to have her as a colleague. And so there's something that she doesn't know that um, her work has been really helpful in seeing something more clearly that I did not see before. So some of you know uh, I worked as a lawyer very briefly in a law firm, uh, uh, all too briefly. Uh, and now I see what it was about working in a law firm uh, that uh, just didn't uh, sit well. And that was, although there are a lot of monetary resources that go with it, uh, one doesn't have a lot of free time. 
uh, temporal resources are something that uh, you don't, uh, aren't able to sort of enjoy. Uh, and uh, Professor Rose has written a fa fabulous book called Free Time, uh, making the case that free time is an issue of justice. And so uh, I see it now, and that's what I tell uh, students. Uh, and I also want to thank Professor Nakalas, uh, who's our co convener of our legal studies a group and has brought some great speakers uh, uh, last year and uh, look forward to the speakers this year. Also want to thank Joanne Blay and Bob Coates uh, for putting uh, this event together. Uh, and uh, also thank you all for being here. Uh, and I know there's folks on the live stream here too. I really appreciate it. I know the weather's out, nice outside and you're like, okay, what, what are we gonna do here, right? What are we gonna do here? Well, um, we're gonna talk about the science of the Constitution. And in one way, it makes sense. We're all wearing masks, right? We're all wearing surgical masks. So you know what, it's a fit. Okay, so what, are we, what, what is it that we're going to uh, do today? So I like to choose your own adventure. Does anyone remember there were these books, Choose Your Own Adventure, right? Okay, yeah, I'm looking at like Jason and Ron, do you know, but the students are like, what? well, there were these books and you could choose what you wanted to do. What's the adventure? Okay, so some of you may say Supreme Court Justice. How many of here would be like, ooh, that would be cool to be? It's okay. Yeah, sweet, right, Supreme Court Justice would be cool. What about a constitutional advocate? You know, you're up in court, arguing cases before the Supreme Court. You know, that's okay, that's pretty cool. So, sometimes folks that are constitutional advocates become Supreme Court justices, right? What about a president or senator? Uh, okay, that's pretty good. You know, you can be a politician. Well, you can see that none of those are the things we're gonna do, right? So if this is what you're like, oh, those are not the adventures, okay? Well, what about this, Democrat or Republican? Okay, uh, we may all raise our hand depending on which of that adventure or which viewpoint one is gonna take. What I wanna do for this particular talk, the adventure is, ta-da, we're gonna be constitutional scientists, okay? Uh, and so how many people say, oh, I would have raised my hand, right? Okay, <laughs> well, that's part of the reason why I'm doing this talk because I have found that when discussing the Constitution, oftentimes the adventure that is chosen is what it would be like, a Supreme Court justice, or a constitutional advocate, or what it's like to look at something as a Democrat or a Republican. That is not what we were gonna be doing here. We we're gonna be approaching it as scientists, so let's put on our masks, which of course are already on, uh, and so that's going to be uh, the adventure today. Okay, so with any talk, right, how many of you are first year students out of curiosity? Wonderful, great, right, you all, I, I know that you all, you know, were part of the shared academic experience. Uh, and so, you know, you learned about the honor code. One of the things about the honor code is your references, right, when you'd give a, you know, write a paper, you write the references, you know. And so let me tell you the references uh, for this talk, okay? There are some references for this talk. Well, uh, my class, Government 66, in spring 2020, these are actually the courses that went over Zoom during COVID. It was Government 66. Government 66, again, I taught later in fall. And Government 67 in spring 2021. Now these courses, I have some students here that were in those courses. Okay, well yeah, so they may be you know, uh, on the live stream, right? Or in fact, it's nice that you know, some of this will be very familiar to them. So this comes out of discussions I've had with students in class in putting together uh, a curriculum over Zoom. And so, you know, Actually, it has advanced learning in a way that I didn't even foresee prior to it. So this talk would not have been possible without having had those courses and not having had the students in those courses. And I would say this, I've said this before, that what thi something that, although this is a practice of disagreement, let me tell you what we all faculty agree on. We agree that we have wonderful students and that students advance our scholarship. And I want you to see that this is actually uh, uh, what's gonna be happening here. Uh, not just students. I'm also really quite, uh, uh, it's wonderful to be a member of the Department uh, of Government. Uh, uh, Jason is here as a, a member of our, also director of the Rockefeller Center. Obviously you met Professor Rose. Uh, and so, you know, the Department of Government is in the social sciences division. And so as a social scientist, the idea that one approaches issues, looking at it in terms of the science of it, is something that I'm thankful to have colleagues uh, in the department. Uh, of government, uh, and also I took a Greek Isle alumni sea cruise in November 2019. Can you imagine it? You're thinking like a cruise? 
I mean, wow, totally decadent, right? I mean, this was prior to, and so in that cruise, there was some talk about this. It wasn't totally formed. So I, what I want you to see is part of this is a result of, and this is just another aspect of it. This is a larger book project on the science of the Constitution, and so it's a real uh, a pleasure. I'm really thankful to have the Rockefeller Center here uh, to not only present in Constitution Day, to present uh, uh, the work uh, uh, here. Okay, so with that, here's an outline. You know you have an outline and they, there's a bunch of pictures here. Maybe some pictures you know, some pictures you don't, right? Uh, and so we're gonna see how all these pictures fit in, okay? So that's like the picture outline uh, uh, of the talk. The other reason is, is that it is important <laughs> to view whatever, that the sort of intellectual exercise here is also fun. There is no reason that learning is not fun. In fact, that's what's so nice about being at Dartmouth and one of the wonderful reasons why we faculty like teaching here. Okay, so outline. So, scientist uh, of the Constitution. Okay, this is Frederick Douglass, okay? Many of you know who Frederick Douglass is? Who here knows who Frederick, okay. So I'm not a historian, I'm not an expert on Frederick Douglass, uh, but just to give you an idea, Frederick Douglass uh, was born in February 1818. Um, he was an African-American abolitionist, an orator, a newspaper publisher. He's famous for uh, his first autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself. He escaped from slavery in 1838. He was only 20 years old, okay? It's kind of sobering uh, fact. Uh, he became the first uh, black U.S. marshal, and in fact, I found this out, was the most photographed American man of the 19th century. So there are a lot of ways in which Frederick Douglass is important to uh, African-American political thought. He's important to, uh, uh, as a historical figure, but there is something else uh, that uh, I want to draw attention to and that I would see him as the first scientist of the Constitution, the first political scientist uh, of the Constitution. And so what do I mean by that? He gave a speech in 1860, so he was 42 years old, and he gave a speech, uh, and the speech was before the Scottish Anti-Slavery Society in Glasgow, Scotland, on March 26th, and what he said in that speech is that the American Constitution is an anti-slavery document, okay? Now, this is prior to the Civil War, prior to the Reconstruction Amendments. Douglas argued and said that the Constitution was an anti-slavery document. So this is the speech that we read in class, and this is the speech that frames the methodology, not only in this lecture, but the methodology of how I approach the study of the Constitution. So what do I mean then by the science uh, of the Constitution? What is Douglas's methodology? Okay, what is Douglas's methodology? So now I'm gonna just read you some parts of this speech, okay, and want you to see how that would resonate today. So in giving this speech, Douglas says, it's a quote, thus for instance, the American government and the American constitution are spoken of in a manner which would naturally lead the hearer to believe that one is identical with the other, when the truth is, they are distinct in character as is a ship and a compass. The one may point right and the other steer wrong. A chart is one thing, the course of the vessel is another. The Constitution may be right, the government is wrong. If the government has been governed by mean, sordid, and wicked passions, it does not follow that the Constitution is mean, sordid, and wicked. He goes on to say, again, it should be borne in mind that the mere text and only the text, and not any commentaries or creeds written by those who wish to give the text a meaning apart from its plain reading, was adopted as the Constitution of the United States. And by the way, to mention that the Constitution went into effect tomorrow, September 21, and the ninth state that ratified it was, take a guess, state of New Hampshire, right. Uh, and so he says it should also be borne in mind that the intentions of the framers of, of, of those who frame the Constitution, be they good or bad for slavery or against slavery, are so respected so far, and so far only as we find those intentions plainly stated in the Constitution. He goes on to say, it would be the wildest of absurdities and lead to endless confusion and mischiefs if instead of looking to the written paper itself for its meaning, it were attempted to make us search it out if this in the secret motives and dishonest intentions of some of the men who took part in writing it. He goes on, these debates were purposely kept out of view 
in order that the people should adopt not the secret motives or expressed intentions of any body, but the simple text of the paper itself. These debates form no part of the original agreement. I repeat, the paper itself and only the paper itself with its own plain written purpose is the Constitution. It must stand or fall, flourish, or fade on its own individual and self-declared character and objects. Again, where would be the advantage of a written constitution if instead of seeking its meaning in its words, we had to seek them in the secret intentions of individuals who may have had something to do with, the writing, with writing the paper? What will the people of America a hundred years hence care about the intentions uh, of those who wrote the constitution? These men are already gone from us and in the course of nature were expected to go from us. They were, for, they were for a generation, but the Constitution is for ages. And that's why, if you haven't picked it up, you pick up your pocket Constitution when you, when you came through this door. This is how we begin as scientists of the Constitution. And that methodology is a methodology that Douglas makes clear in this speech. And so this methodology is not only that's going to frame this lecture, this is what I mean by the science of the Constitution. What I mean on one hand is the American government or what the framers' thoughts and feelings were, that is not what Douglas is saying is a science of the Constitution, but rather the document itself. Let's look at the document and see what it says. And as a scientist, that's noise, right? We all know that's noise. And so if you take a course in statistics, you're like noise. We're not studying noise. And so this this, this talk is studying the science of the text, beginning with the text of the Constitution. So that's the methodology that centers not only this lecture, but also the course. And I think that's really interesting because you have here an African American who was enslaved, escaped slavery, making a speech that the Constitution is an anti-slavery document. I'm gonna use that methodology in studying the text. That's what this presentation is going to draw on, and that's what I draw on in class. Okay, so how do we then translate this methodology today? So that's Douglas's, Douglas's methodology today. Well, okay, so if you're looking at it today, we still have the text, no doubt, right? That's why you all got this pocket constitution. Actually, one thing, this pocket constitution, you can, all, you can bring it anywhere. One time I did bring it, I've told students, I brought it uh, on a date, uh, and uh, you know, I was talking to him, and as it turned out, he was a Scalia supporter, and I said, oh, well, actually, there's a passage in here and so um, it's really interesting. Well, there was no second date, so don't bring it on a date, okay? Uh, but bring it to class. Okay, so what's, how do we understand his methodology uh, uh, today? Uh, so we have the text, okay? We also have the Supreme Court, okay? Those are the current members of the Supreme Court. Now, what do I say when I say the Supreme Court? What we have is, we could study their biographies. That's not what we do in class. We don't read their biographies. Maybe some folks know something about them. What we study, are the opinions that they write. The opinions are part of the science of the Constitution. The opinions are crucial to understanding what is happening here, okay? To understanding how this document works, okay? We all sort of look and see now, I mean, there was a time when, you know, uh, now through the internet, anytime there's an opinion, it, it, you know, it gets, it gets published on the uh, website. Uh, and, Students that take my class, we would read probably 700 pages worth of opinions. That's just the opinions, right? Uh, uh, and so, um, okay. And so the opinions are crucial. The opinions are crucial. And so let me uh, uh, play for you uh, something that uh, Justice uh, O'Connor says, okay? So let me do some fancy AV uh, work here. It's really not that fancy, but you know, This is Justice Connor on the Believe It or Not Daily Show with John Stewart. Program. We're talking with former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. We were talking about, you know, you, you, you mentioned something to me. Uh, we were talking about the Supreme Court, and they seem very protective over their process. Yes. And you were saying one of the reasons you thought that might be. Well, the Supreme Court is the one branch of government that has written explanations for everything it decides and does. That's pretty impressive. No other branch of government, no member of Congress, has to write some written explanation of everything. But, but that is such a good point. Yes, the, not bad. The, but it is. You have, in, in the legislature, you know, things happen that seem inexplicable on the legislative side right. or on the executive side. That's right. And you ask, and no one seems to know how it 
happened or went down. It's sort of these backroom things that just show up right. and then they, they vote on it and you don't know why. But every member of the court has right. to have a written explanation. And you can join someone else's opinion and say, I agree with that and sign it. But every justice has signed on to some explanation. That's pretty impressive, I think. It's very impressive. In some ways, this is going to sound crazy, do the justices, after doing that job for a while, feel judged? And therefore, that is that well, why I they're somewhat protected? I think you do protective? feel judged. You do feel judged. You right. feel that everything you do is under scrutiny of everybody in the country who has an interest in it. Right. They can see it. Any idiot it. can, like, make fun of it on a show. Correct. I mean, it's just... And that's right. <laughs> make a joke of it or right. whatever. And that's not fair. No, hardly. But well, it, if I see somebody works. doing it, you can be okay. sure <laughs> I will stop them as it, as it goes. Um, is there something to when you get to... Okay, so I encourage you to check this out and to uh, see the rest of it. And so what's interesting here is that what Justice O'Connor makes clear is that what is n it's not only uh, that the opinion is central to the science of the Constitution, but the idea is that, that the opinion, that the uh, uh, Supreme Court is distinctive in offering these opinions. It is the practice of the Supreme Court to write an opinion about some particular issue that reaches, to sign an opinion and to give what Justice O'Connor says actually in a case, a principal justification uh, for uh, uh, the, 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 what the Constitution means in their decision, okay? So if we take Douglas's, now if you look, when Douglas was making his speech, Although the Supreme Court had reached its ascendancy in terms of the idea that the Supreme Court has a final say about what the Constitution means, that itself was a developmental story. So that's why when we take his methodology and apply it today, we have the text, right, which you all have here, uh, and then you have the opinions, okay? Those are the, that, that's the data. That's the data here in looking at the science uh, of the Constitution. Okay, so now if we take this methodology then what is the science of the, how does a constitution work, okay? I wanna suggest that there are then three features to the constitution. One is the document arranges and limits public power. Okay, so let's take a moment here. By arranging public power, that, by that, it arranges the power between, for example, the federal government and the state government but it also limits public power. Now, oftentimes these limits are described as constitutional rights or they're described as constitutional liberties. It's in a way more accurate to talk about limits of public power because that's actually what's happening. Think of the Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law. That's a limit on what Congress may do. The 14th Amendment, no state shall. That's a limit on what states may do. So the document arranges and limits public power. Second, the Supreme Court has the power to say and justify what those arrangements and limits are. Well, that's why we always wait, what's the Supreme Court going to decide, right? What's the Supreme Court going to decide? Now, these two features may very well be like, okay, yeah. You may be like, okay, that makes sense. Not particularly, uh, you know, uh, uh, interesting. Uh, although uh, uh, it's important to see how those two pieces fit with the third piece that's the center of this talk. There is a practice of disagreement on the court in exercising this power. This is going to be the crucial you know, feature that is often not seen clearly, or so I'm going to suggest. And that's what we are going to be studying, right? It's like we're all like, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like you, you have something that you, we're all looking at it, we're all studying it. So it's like, you know, the Constitution, that's why you have the text. We can look at it. We can study it as scientists, right, in a way that being objective. We're not looking at it in terms of Democrat or Republican. We're not looking at it in terms of uh, a, a constitutional advocate. We're looking at it like someone would study a, a volcano. Well, how does a volcano work? Or one would study any kind of, for example, a living thing. How, is it, how does it work? So there is a practice of disagreement on the court in exercising that power, okay? And so what do I mean by that? Okay, let's go to the document. Uh, and I wanna suggest to you that there are two political philosophies or models of a republic in the document, okay? Oftentimes you hear about different branches of government, right? You all know the three branches, right? You all know, right? You've learned that, yeah, okay. 
what I want to suggest to you is that in, in addition to the three branches of government, there are two models of a republic in the document, two political philosophies. There is a notion of a traditional republic, and there is a notion of a modern republic. Okay, so what do I mean by that? And again, part of these are descriptions of through discussions with students, seeking what language would be the most accurate way of describing it. So this is what the up-to-date, you know, and so part of what's nice about giving this talk is that seeing is there a, a way of characterizing that's more accurate, but what do I mean by traditional versus modern? A traditional republic, if we go back to the Constitution, it's the arrangements and limits of public power. A traditional republic, the arrangement of power is state-centered. Why do I say that's state-centered traditional? Because prior to the Constitution, there were the Articles of Confederation. That was the governing document after uh, independence. And in fact, that's in, this is why I like this pocket constitution. Uh, this pocket constitution also has the Articles of Confederation, uh, which is the document that preceded the Constitution. So that was very state-centered. So the traditional republic, the arrangement of power is state-centered. And also, the limits on powers are rules. I'll come back to that in just a second, just to give you a sense. The modern republic, the arrangement of power, is nation-centered. And the limits on power are standards. So when the Constitution was being ratified, there was a sense in which the older state model right, is not going to be good enough. So we needed a nation-centered. We needed, actually, a United States, a larger federal government. And so as a result, there is this modern republic. But at the same time, we did not get rid of the traditional republic. In fact, states are the crucial mechanism by which Americans interact with both on the constitutional level. There is no national referendum. There's nothing in the Constitution that allows individual Americans to act. Americans act through their states, whether that means through the electoral college, whether that mean even in selecting, obviously, their representatives and senators, they're directly voting for them, but they're voting from the state, right? The senator or the representative. So the traditional republic is one that's the arrangement of power is state-centered. The modern republic is the arrangement of power is nation-centered. We look to the nation. So what do I mean then by limits on powers are rules versus standards? Okay, so for example, if you're driving down I-89, Right, it says you can't drive over 65. I sometimes drive over 65, I'll be frank. Uh, that's a rule, no driving over 65. A standard would be drive reasonably, okay? So you can imagine that uh, if you're describing something as a rule or a standard, rules are uh, uh, categorical, uh, rules are very rigid, standards are not categorical, standards invite a kind of flexibility. Uh, and so if you look at these two republics, you see that these republics align with an either anti-federalist political philosophy or a federalist political philosophy. So what do I mean by that? The anti-federalists were very committed to a traditional republic of state-centered. Okay, that's what they saw as the arrangement had to always be focused on the state. The federalists were like, no, the arrangement of power has to be nation-centered. We need to move away from this traditional republic. This traditional republic is not going to be conducive uh, for uh, the health of the republic. So the idea here is, and then think of rules versus standard. The one thing that the anti-federalists wanted were a bill of rights. They said, we have to have a bill of rights in the document, which are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, that begin, Congress shall make no law. Well, those are rules. They said, we need to spell it out exactly what those limits are. Whereas the Federalists were like, oh, we don't need a Bill of Rights. Why do we have to say that Congress may not have the, have the power to do something when they wouldn't have to do it anyway? Well, the idea was that they understood limits on powers as standards. They understood it as standards. And so what I want to suggest to you is that the document, the Constitution, affirms both. It affirms both a traditional republic and a modern republic, okay? And so what does that mean, or how, do we, how can we understand that? Okay, so if you're looking at the outline, you remember you saw a picture of Frederick Douglass, right? And then, uh, um, so these are two political philosophies or models uh, of a republic. Uh, oh, before I get there, this is uh, McCulloch v. Maryland, a very famous case. Justice John Marshall was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to really establish the Supreme Court as the final uh, arbiter of what the Constitution says. And in that decision, he was a Federalist, in that decision, 
uh, he held that Congress has the implied power to charter a bank. But he said two things that are important here. He referenced both the traditional republic. No political dreamer was ever wild enough to think of breaking down the lines which separate the states and of compounding the American people into one common mass. Of consequence, when they, when he means they, he means the people. When they act, they act in their states. States are, the, uh, uh, are how we Americans uh, interact with the Constitution. It's through the states. So that's a reference to the traditional republic. At the same time in that decision, he says we must admit, as all must admit, that the powers of the government are limited and that its limits are not to be transcended. But we think the sound construction of the Constitution must allow to the national legislature that discretion with respect to the means by which the power it confirms are to be carried into execution, which will enable that body to perform the high duties assigned to it in the manner most beneficial to the people. The idea here is he's also referencing the modern republic. The modern republic is nation-centered. It has to be able to respond to the exigencies uh, of the time. And so you see in Marshall's opinion both of these. Okay, You see both of these. And what I want to suggest to you is because both are within the document, well, there is going to be a practice of disagreement with these two models. Okay, and how do we see that? Well, you saw the picture of Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg. Okay, everyone know who they are, right? I mean, one thing, if you ask Democrats who's their favorite, probably pick the one to the right. You ask Republicans who's their fa favorite, they'll probably pick the one to the left. Okay, what I want to say to you, one thing to know, I mean, they're both deceased, but they were the best of friends. They traveled together. It wasn't like they were just colleagues, they were friends. Right, uh, 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 Julie and I have to travel. We have to travel together, right, Julie? Then we can, you know. So, uh, 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 and so they, they um, actually that would be fun, wouldn't it? And so, you know, they, they were the best of friends. So part of in sort of researching this, 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 seeing this as a science of the Constitution, the idea was how is it that they're such good friends? How can it be that they're such good friends? In fact, Justice Ginsburg's very project before she got on the court as a constitutional advocate was the idea that gender equality is part of the Equal Protection Clause. What did Scalia say? No, it's not part of it. They disagreed on that. You would think, well, but they were, they were friends. What I want to suggest to you is the reason is because both of them personify this kind of practice of disagreement that is a feature of the document, not a bug. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so Scalia famously said, the Constitution is dead, dead, dead rather than a living document, okay? What does Ginsburg say? The Constitution can't be dead. If it's dead, it won't serve society. Uh, and so this was, in the, this was a case concerning the Virginia Military Institute. It was an institute in Virginia that only allowed men to enroll. The Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg writing the opinion, we read this in class, struck it down saying that that's unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause, and Justice Scalia dissented. And dissent says, but in my view, the function of this court is to preserve our society's values regarding, among other things, equal protection, not to revise them, to prevent backsliding from the degree of restriction the Constitution imposed upon democratic government, not to prescribe on our own authority progressively higher degrees. So what does... What did uh, Ginsburg say in that decision? So a prime part of the history of our Constitution is a story of the extension of constitutional rights and protection to people once ignored and excluded. VMI's story continued as our comprehension of we the people expanded. Well, if you see this, this is a notion of a traditional republic, state-centered a focus on rules. There's no rule. The rule has to, we have to see the Constitution is very clear and there's, it says equal protection. We have to understand it in its historical context. It had not anything to do with gender. This is an anti-federalist political philosophy that Scalia is drawing on. At the same time, you see Ginsburg talking about a modern republic. A modern republic, the limits are standards. It's precisely their standards that allow a kind of living notion of what's going on. And so you see Ginsburg uh, 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 you know, exercising this kind of federalist political philosophy. So if you see it this way, then it, what turns out is justices are, in effect, our political philosophers. They are our philosopher kings or queens, 
right? And so if you're wondering, well, that goes to Professor Rose teaches political ideas, part of political philosophy. When you read Plato's Republic, you talk about philosopher kings. So you see the connection here that this is a document of political philosophy. And these justices are our political philosophers. And surprise, surprise, they disagree because there are two models of political philosophy that are in the document, that are in the document. Okay, so, okay, this is, this is really the, um, oh, let me say one thing uh, 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 here too. Because I'm saying there's a practice of disagreement is not to say that the Supreme Court justices don't often agree, okay? So, for instance, uh, this is from ABC News. Uh, during this uh, last term, they found that 67% uh, of the cases were unanimous or near unanimous. Uh, and so um, there's definitely, uh, don't, there's no reason to overestimate uh, uh, or sort of look at it and suggest that they're always disagreeing. They're oftentimes agreeing. So for example, there was a recent case that they decided that was unanimous where the city of Philadelphia uh, had a system where they allowed private charities and organizations to put kids in foster homes. One of those organizations was a Catholic charity that refused to put uh, children in homes with same-sex couples. And so the city of Philadelphia then said, we're not going to contract with you. The California Charities brought that to the Supreme Court and said, this violates the First Amendment's free exercise clause, the limit on public power that says, you may not infringe the free exercise. And so it was a unanimous opinion that the court said this was indeed a violation of the free exercise clause. It was because the city of Philadelphia actually allowed for an exemption in the law, but uh, did not say, did not uh, uh, allow the Catholic charity to uh, avail themselves of that exemption. So one way to read this is that both the idea of the limit or the free exercise clause as either a rule or a standard. Justice Scalia famously wrote the case that said the free exercise clause is a rule, which says no exemptions. You have the other justices saying, well, no, there's a standard. And so as a result, we're going to allow exemptions in certain cases. So you could see how both those could lead to disagreement, but also could lead to agreement. And so they did lead to agreement in this particular case. Okay, So uh, I don't want to sort of say that this practice of disagreement that doesn't mean that they're not agreeing. It may be that the, both a traditional republic and a modern republic would come to the same outcome. Okay, so here is a money slide. This is a slide that I, there was a more time spent on than others, right? Probably, you know, so, 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 so here's why. Okay, so just this year, uh, actually just last week, Justice Thomas, uh, I don't have this in here because he just spoke uh, at Notre Dame. Earlier in the year, uh, uh, you had Justice Breyer and Justice Amy, Justice Amy Barrett, who's the newest member of the court. They spoke to public audiences about what they do as Supreme Court justices. And here's what Justice Barrett said. She said that, quote, judicial philosophies are not the same as political parties. She said that people were wrong to see the court as a partisan institution. Quote, to say that the court's reasoning is flawed is different from saying the court is acting in a partisan manner. Barrett said, quote, I think we need to evaluate what the court is doing on its own terms. Justice Breyer at Harvard Law School said the following, quote, we see a growing public suspicion and distrust of all governmental institutions and a gradual change in the way the press understand the judicial institution with journalists routinely affixing labels such as conservative or liberal to judicial nominees. Justices are not, according to Breyer, quote, junior level politicians, he said. Instead, he said, I believe jurisprudential differences account for most, perhaps almost all, judicial disagreements. Well, what are they saying there when they're saying we are not partisans? Remember, go back to choose your own adventure. We already said we're not choosing an adventure of Democrat or Republican. We're not choosing uh, an adventure uh, as a politician. We're approaching it as the scientist. So how can we understand then the difference between the political philosophy models that we discussed, traditional republic, modern republic, versus politics? This is a fine distinction, but this is a distinction that as, you know, all of us are here on masks that kind of have layers. We've got to be really careful about it, make sure that we see this. Okay, so here are some issues. I put them in red or blue, right, depending on their political uh, valence. 
Spending on the national military, that's often a Republican a talking point. Spending on national social programs, often a Democrat talking point. Favoring a strong commander in chief, actually that's a talking point for both depending on who's in office, right? Uh, that's why it's both. Access to abortion services, obviously that's something that's on the left. Access to school choice, that's something that's often said uh, on the right. Or sanctuary states, that's something that is discussed. Uh, and by sanctuary states, just so you know what that means, that means states that are not going to cooperate with the federal government to enforce federal immigration policy. Um, voting restrictions, you see that states have been passing voting restrictions, that's on the right. California's high emission standards uh, mandate. So California has such high emission standards for cars that as a result, if you're gonna buy a car or sell it in the California market, you have to meet the emission standards because it's such a large part of the market. Obviously that has an impact uh, uh, on the kind of cars that are produced. At the same time you have Florida, right? Uh, uh, has a no mask mandate, right? My folks live in Florida, I actually grew up outside uh, of Tampa. Uh, you have criminal due process rights, the fourth, fifth, and sixth amendments. Uh, this is often sometimes those on the left look to these amendments, and those on the right look to the second amendment. Okay, that's a lot of disagreement, a lot of politics, okay? So, yes, no doubt, those are differences. But what I wanna suggest to you is that's different from political philosophy. The political philosophy is the traditional republic, where the arrangement of power is state-centered and the limits on powers are rules. In fact, all of those on the right draw from this traditional republic. The reason that sanctuary states operate, the reason that California and other states could say we're not cooperating with the federal government is precisely because a traditional republic says the arrangement of power is state-centered. The reason, for instance, that Florida's no mask mandate and there is precisely because of a traditional republic, it's state-centered, they get to decide what's best for Floridians. If you think of limits on powers or rules, the rules are the ones that are written into the document. This is why those that look to the Second Amendment say, yes, well, we gotta advance gun rights. Those that look to the criminal due process and look to the uh, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments are looking to, uh, uh, also looking to rules and saying, look, the rule applies no matter what, a right to an attorney, a right to some kind of due process. At the same time, the modern republic, the arrangement of powers, the nation center, limits on powers or standards, here too you can see both political, political sides drawing on that republic or that political philosophy. Spending on the national military uh, is something that those on the right often talk about. That's because they're operating in a modern republic that's nation centered. Uh, uh, access to abortion services. The reason that that is seen as, that's a limit on powers are standards. We have to understand a standard. The idea of the standard would be that it's like either privacy or however we're gonna understand the standard. And so as a result, access to school choice. There's nowhere in the constitution that says access to school choice. Actually, there was a case uh, uh, in the 20th century where the court ruled uh, uh, in effect that the limit on power here is a standard. So what I'm saying to you is that politics is one thing, okay? We can disagree about the politics, and there may be very, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, we're not, I'm not a politician, uh, but I understand that there's a, this is that we're Democrats and Republicans. This is where the partisan comes in on the right side. But on the left side is the political philosophy, is the, actually the science of the document. And as it turns out, both republics, both political philosophies are appealed to on either side. That is something to see, then it suggests this disagreement is not a bug but rather a feature of it. So whenever I see this, you know when you ever see this, people are like, oh, oh no, we're so divided. I see this, because this only happens, right? The reason they're red and blue states is precisely because there are two political philosophies uh, in the document. Uh, and once we see that, we see this practice of disagreement on the Supreme Court in exercising their power to decide what these arrangements and limits are. Some look to an anti-federalist philosophy that sees the arrangement as state-centered and the limits on power as rules. Very particular, it has to be stated in there, it has to be historically grounded. The other side sees uh, the arrangement as nation-centered and the limits on public power as standard. So the idea of a standard would be like, well, we gotta look at this standard in terms of our contemporary society, what's happening today, and sort of understand what's going on. And so there are, these two republics that are basically in the same document. 
So actually there was an opera based on Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia by Derek Wang. I went to it, it was actually in White River Junction. Uh, uh, did you go to it? Yeah, and so uh, it was quite nice and the, uh, the headline is, we are different but we are one. Uh, and so now I see that what's the one, there's a, that's why they were such great friends. Of course they were such great, it makes sense that they're, it fits that they're great friends because of these two political philosophies. Okay, so what do we have then, uh, uh, and this is a final uh, slide and then we can uh, ask questions. Um, okay, so if you look at the preamble to the document, it tells you what the document is for. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. Okay, more perfect union is what the document is for. Now. What union came before, as you said, it was the Articles of Confederation. That was what we read in class. That's the, you know, what was the document uh, before the Constitution. So what I want to suggest to you is that then there are two forces within the Constitution. On one hand, there is the living document modern republic that pushes forward. At the same time, there is a dead document traditional republic force that pushes opposite, backwards. And so when you think of the language, a more perfect, how can something be more perfect? Does it make sense to say more? If it's perfect, why would you, how, do you say, how do you understand more perfect? I want to suggest that that is the practice of disagreement. It's perfect, suggesting, oh, nothing to be done. It's, you know, we don't have to do anything more. <laughs> and so what is happening is we are always having this balance, and if you would see, one of the last pictures was, so this is, okay, by the way, this, so I, when I was t teaching the class last spring, I told the students, uh, the one class I said I would learn to play the preamble on the guitar, that went horribly, I couldn't play, it was really bad. So next time I said I'm gonna build a Lego set. So throughout the course I was building a Lego set and I wasn't telling them what it was. And it turned out it was Baby Yoda, okay? Uh, not to be confused with the Yoda from Star Wars, because but that's for, that's getting in the weeds here, right? You're like, okay. So, um, you know, Yoda always says there must be a balance in the Force, right? There must be a balance in the Force. I want to suggest to you that this is a balance in the Constitution. Now, you may think, wait, did the framers know about Yoda? Well, if you know it, it happened a long time ago in a galaxy far away, presumably before the Constitution was ratified. So who knows? But, you know, that's just sci-fi kind of geek stuff to know. But um, Actually, versus the difference between that and Star Trek, because Star Trek takes place in the future, Star Wars takes place in the past. But the idea here is that you have a balance. And it's this balance, I want to suggest to you, that this document has been functioning since 1789, the document that, uh, you know, uh, that we all here, uh, living here in uh, the state of New Hampshire, being the ninth state that ends up ratifying the document uh, uh, tomorrow. And so let me just end with some teaser trailers, because this is part of a larger project, and so, some, 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 some questions that come out of this sort of methodology that goes back to Douglas is what lives matter according to the Constitution? You'd be surprised to know the answer. I'm actually presenting it at the political science conference next week. The marvel of American federalism and the United Federation of Planets. I love this one, right? Because if you don't know what the United Federation of Planets are, you're like, you don't know what to say, right? Starry decisis, the Supreme Court versus the presidency. Uh, and when the court fails to persuade states. Okay, so I will end it there and happily take your questions and we may have some questions from the live stream, so. Email, so for those on the live stream, uh, email Rocky Q&A uh, uh, at dartmouth.edu and uh, yeah, and so don't be shy you know, students, you know? Yes, please, wonderful. Oh, should I watch the microphone? Or should yes. Yeah, that would be great, because then they can put it on the live stream and, you know. So, can you oh, just turn that? Is, is that better? Oh, yeah, that works. Uh, you'll excuse me. Um, I just was curious if you could talk briefly a little bit more about um, the opening lines by Frederick Douglass, uh, because as the presentation was going, I know we included Supreme Court opinion as part of the science of the Constitution, uh, but it certainly seems like that could go both ways and that uh, Frederick Douglass or those that sympathize with him could have decided that the you know Supreme Court themselves are part of the people steering the ship and could very well lead it astray. 
So that's good. And so part of what to see is that the nature of the Supreme Court uh, as having the final say about what these arrangements and limits of public power are was maybe not as settled uh, back then as it is now. Uh, and so part of that is that that is true. So part of the one way to consider is why is it that it turns out that the Supreme Court is the one that has this power of the word. I mean, one way to view it is if you look at it, you see that uh, uh, the president has a power of the sword, Congress uh, has a power of the purse, and so then the Supreme Court has this power to persuade, in effect, this power of saying what the Constitution is. And so in one sense, that wasn't as settled, uh, but that is settled now. That's why oftentimes the uh, nominees, there's such a fight, let's say, a political fight over them, because everyone sees the Constitute, sees the Supreme Court as having the final say about the Constitution, even though it is true that that's not necessarily written in the document. Uh, and so in that sense, it is taking Douglas's methodology and applying it uh, today. While others are thinking about yeah, questions, please. and I think some coming in from the live stream, I, just, I wanted to take the bait and ask um, the what lives matter according to the Constitution question, since if you if you want to tell us a bit about a preview. Yeah, so I'm giving a talk next time, next uh, political science uh, uh, conference. Uh, and so the question of what lives matter according to the Constitution, you often have this sort of political seemingly sort of division between on one hand black lives matter, on the other hand all lives matter. Well, if you look at the Constitution, the th and by Constitution I mean you look at the science of it, including what the court has said about it, the 13th Amendment not only abolishes slavery, but the Supreme Court says that it endows Congress with the power to end the relics, the badges and incidents of slavery. And so in fact, what the 13th Amendment and scholars have actually also sort of worked this out, that the 13th Amendment says black lives matter precisely because there was a time when they did not matter. And the 13th Amendment makes clear that Congress has the power to end the badges and incidents of slavery, which, all would, be, which would obviously mean that African Americans are ones that are, that it's precisely uh, seeking to ensure the equality of African Americans. At the same time, the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, according to the court, says that no state uh, uh, shall discriminate on the basis of race sex, sexual orientation or, national, or nationality. So all lives matter regardless of those attributes. So what you really see is the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment both saying on one hand, one says black lives matter, the other one says all lives matter. And actually you could see these as two kinds of ideas of racial justice. The 13th Amendment looking to our actual society and the idea that there was a historical fact of slavery that has to be accounted for, and at the same time, the 14th Amendment that looks to an ideal society and says in an ideal society, there wouldn't be this kind of discrimination. Thanks, Julie, you took the bait. See, you know. Um, I had a quick question. I think an important outcome of this like deliberation and disagreement is the speed at which decisions are made in the government, which is often really slow. Um, and so I was curious if you could talk a bit about the dichotomy between like maybe these decisions should be very slow to come to the best decision or sometimes they're made too slowly and if this should be remedied or if you think that's how the government should be running right now. Okay, so this is a good question. So one way to look at Supreme Court decisions is Supreme Court decisions are often very slow, right? Because not only does a case have to first be litigated in lower court, it has to come up for appeal, their arguments, their briefs that are submitted. It takes the court a long time to decide. Now this is in contrast to what's happened recently is what's called the shadow docket where the Supreme Court has decided cases. They're not actually deciding the merits of the case, but they're deciding emergency orders. And there's a sense in which if those, that we don't want to see those, actually those are the ones that are often quick, right? They're just happening in a, 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 without the very kind of briefing and the very kind of arguments that go with the importance of the opinion. So my sense is that it's precisely because the Supreme Court takes time to deliver its opinion that lends, is, is a way to exercise this power to persuade, this power to say what the Constitution is, is why these decisions are so impactful. When that is not happening, then there's going to be a way in which that's not going to advance that. Please. So I was just going to ask uh, Justice Breyer in his upcoming or his book that just came out. Uh, he wrote in his prologue that he was asked by the Chief Justice of Ghana 
why you know P the American public still continues to believe in the Supreme Court and continues to follow its decisions. So I was curious and wanted to pose that question to you. What qualities of the Supreme Court do you think make it such a lasting institution? And in the wake of you know a lot of uh, I guess discontent about the Supreme Court, do you think there's a future where people don't buy into the Supreme yeah. Court? So this is a good question. So. You know, I think one thing that helps, the Supreme Court doesn't have televised, they don't allow television, they don't allow to see the oral arguments because the idea being is that it's not about a soundbite, it's about the principal justification, it's about understanding the implications of either looking at the issue through the eyes or the political philosophy of a traditional versus a modern republic, that was political philosophies, and so they're not to have them televised, so there's a sense in which that it advances uh, the role of the court here. Also, the fact the court is often secret. It's not so much that the court is, uh, you know, advertising uh, what's happening. And so uh, there's also a way in which Supreme Court, uh, you know, they wear these uh, black robes. There's only nine of them. They sit for life. Uh, they're not, uh, you know, subject to election. Uh, and so there's a way in which there's a kind of, you know, academic tenure, like you can imagine. Like, so. I view a very kind of synergy between, on one hand, a justice and another, and on the other hand, a scholar, a political philosopher, right? Um, Julie's a political philosopher, right? So, you know, and so there's a way in which, just like academic freedom, for those of you who are in that shared academic experience, you know, tenure allows uh, scholars to engage in uh, subjects and issues uh, without any kind of constraints. And so in a similar way, you have the Supreme Court engaging and looking at it and saying, okay, how are we gonna decide this issue? And so part of it is, is that that is done in a way that uh, uh, sort of advances the mystique of the court. It's kind of, it's a mystique, right? There's a mystique. That's why I always ask students, how many of you would wanna be a Supreme Court justice? More people raise their hand to be a Supreme Court justice than they do to be president or senator, by the way, in general, right? Uh, so part of it is there's something here, right? Thanks a lot, Sona. Appreciate it. Um, is there any room for judicial pragmatism in your argument? Mm. Where would that fall? Yeah, that's good. I, I would say that judicial pragmatism would be a kind of understanding of the limits on public power as standards. In some way, when we're, when we're approaching a question about whether what a particular limit means, whether it's free exercise or freedom of speech or equal protection, if we adopt a kind of standard view, one way to see that is that standard would incorporate a kind of pragmatic calculus that a rule would say, well, you gotta go one or the other. And so there's a way in which if we just had rules, it would, it would, be, it would be so rigid that the document would break. If we just had standards, the document would be so soft, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have the strength it does. And so what's interesting is Justice Ginsburg in that decision, the VMI decision, when she wrote her opinion, she said, uh, this was a, at VMI, like, I don't know, maybe 20 years, you know, years later, she said, yeah, well, when Scalia wrote his dissent, he goes, he said, she, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm paraphrasing what she said, she said he, he said, Ruth, here's my dissent, my penultimate dissent, and she goes, you know, his dissent hit all the soft spots of my uh, opinion, so then I went back and revised it to make them. And so, in one way, you see that there is this rule versus standard, so I would, I, I, you know, and so I would say pragmatism comes in there, and that, you know, uh, uh, is a way to see that as a kind of balance. Yeah, please, Harshal. Thanks, thanks for a great talk. Um, question I've, always wanted, I've always, always wanted to ask you, and this goes back to Justice uh, Barrett's recent comments okay. about how the court is not composed of kind of JV politicians. Yeah. And so the claim is that they're not politicians and they're just embracing diverse judicial philosophies. But of course, then the question is, like, from where do these judicial philosophies derive? Mm. And um, I mean, it's really a chicken and egg yeah. question, but one does sort of have to have their own answer to this. Are, are the judicial philosophies prior to a set of political commitments? Are they a derivation of them, but in the language of law such that we can claim mm. that they're still not politicians? But, how do you sort of thread this needle? This is by Professor Nachlas, by the way. He is a great, uh, uh, I know he's teaching and uh, to this, and so that's such a wonderful question. Thank you, Herschel. So one way is that to see that these political philosophies in some way are arising from the text of the document, that they're arising from the commitments 
that were made in writing and drafting the document. So what you have here is there were Federalists and there were Anti-Federalists. So when there was a vote up and down on the Constitution, you had both of those groups were voting. Now, maybe it turned out that some of the Anti-Federalists, they ended up losing out. But the, by making sure that there was a Bill of Rights, by placing in the document this traditional republic in the role of states. And so one way to see it is that the political philosophies are baked into the text, but then they are elaborated as justices confront new issues that may arise. And so the idea is, is that the political philosophies came first because they're part of the document. And now the question becomes, how is it that justices end up seeing, how do we have, uh, if you'd ask, federalist justices and anti-federalist justices? And so, you know, part of it is, is that, well, think of the United States. We are a very litigious country. The, the Amer we sue all the time, right? There's a sense in which the rule of law is very important in a way uh, to Americans, they're always like, we'll leave it to the court to decide. It's always looking to the court to decide. And so there's a sense in which as law schools train lawyers and then those folks become justices that you have, even within scholarly work, you have this on one hand commitment to a traditional republic uh, uh, where the limits are rules. The idea is, is that we have to follow strictly what the Bill of Rights says versus the limits on standards. And so the idea here is that, that it comes out of uh, the initial document uh, is what I would say, but that's an excellent question, Herschel. Thank you. We have time for one more, Joanne. Yeah. yeah. Think, uh, last one. Okay. Make it good. Well, uh, a lot of well, right you know, Professor Nackla set me up well, so hopefully. Good. Um, it's a slight follow-up. Even if we do assume that these po um, political philosophies are prior to any political commitments there's the question of which political philosophies get um, pushed up to the Supreme Court. And given the role that politics ha plays there, for example, the Federalist Society and the other societies on the left, um, why should we believe that the Constitution will hold you know, America's um, divided parts together rather than America's political divide um, effectively poisoning the Constitution? So to say that last part, the question uh, why, is... Yes, given the, po the political nature sometimes of Supreme Court appointments, why should the assumption be that the Constitution will be able to bridge the divide rather than the petty politics of the everyday um, effectively wounding, wounding the Constitution itself? So, you know, sometimes there's a sense in which there is a hypothetical of, like, what would happen if, you know, and so what I would say is that as of now, uh, the Constitution is functioning and so is the Supreme Court precisely in this way. And, and so sometimes the political theater uh, may very well take a prominent stage just because, you know, for various reasons or it could be precisely to for a political kind of calculus if you're seeking to get the vote out. And so there's a way in which you know, I'm, I, you know there's a way in which it's describing what's happening as accurately as possible, and which would say that right now, right? I mean, now what you're saying, like, well, do, do, is there a sense in maybe 20 years from now this, the, the court is seen as uh, um, is somehow illegitimate? Now, what's interesting is I will say this one question at the end, when the court fails to persuade states, uh, you know, we can see are there cases in which the court has, uh, for instance, if you look at the issue of uh, abortion, the court has constantly said at some point, one way or another, that there is this limit on what states may do in order to uh, ensure this fundamental liberty. But states, and look at the Texas law, the most recent Texas law, it has not persuaded states. And so part of it is, is that there is this way in which the Supreme Court is not a separate institution that is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, independent of the other actors in the Constitution, the other actors, for example, being not only uh, the f president, the Congress, and the executive branch, but also states. And so there's a way in which uh, if it becomes, you know, that's what would seem if it turned out that there were states that simply were not complying uh, with the Supreme Court, or there was some, well, then you, you may raise this that's what I see you raising that kind of question. I mean, you know, we'll see. I mean, I, 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 I don't see it as likely in a way, in part because if you go back to this slide, what is nice is that 
it may, this may not have been the case historically. So for example, federalism and this notion of a traditional republic was always the province in a way of conservatives and not liberals. Uh, in part, precisely because of the Trump presidency, you have a kind of acknowledgement that this traditional republic can actually advance progressive goals, right? So for example, uh, Heather Gerken, who's dean at Yale Law School, she came to give a talk here a couple of years ago and written a piece on progressive federalism. Uh, and so as long as you have both sides appealing to both republics, both political philosophies, there's a sense in which what you're con that, that kind of concern in a way uh, may be uh, uh, less likely to happen, but you know, that's, you know, uh, but uh, point well taken. Good, okay, well why don't we, why don't we end it there? I wanna thank you all for your questions and thank you for coming. If, if you're joining us for dinner, if you're a student who's joining us for dinner, head to the Hitchcock tent, we'll meet you there with the food. <laughs> oh, God, glad you could make it, Jason. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, so we talked. No, I'm part of this new project, so I'd love to hear. Yeah.